It is my privilege to introduce today's presenter, uh, Dr. Janani Ravi. Dr. Ravi is an assistant professor at Michigan State University in the Department of Pathobiology and Diagnostic Investigation, as well as the Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. Before becoming faculty, Dr. Ravi completed her PhD in computational biology at the University of Virginia Tech and her postdoctoral research um, at the Public Health Research Institute of Rutgers University. Dr. Ravi's research involves developing computational approaches to study the molecular basis of pathogenesis and intervention of infectious diseases. Focusing on both pathogen and host aspects, Dr. Ravi's group leverages large-scale genomic data to gain testable insights into infectious disease biology, protein sequence structure, function relationships, and drug repurposing. Dr. Ravi is also actively engaged in training, education, and outreach, focusing on increasing the representation of underrepresented groups in data science and our programming. She's the founder of Our Ladies East Lansing and Women Plus Data Science, with the goal of providing a safe space for women and gender minorities to learn and discuss coding and data science. So without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Janani Ravi. Thank you so much, Lucas. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I want to begin by thanking uh, Casey and Sean for this invitation. I'm excited to be here today, and I'm looking forward to this opportunity to tell you about our research and learn a little about yours too. Today, I will share with you our recent work on developing new computational approaches for studying uh, molecular pathogenesis and intervention of infectious diseases. I just want to say this up front. If anyone in the audience has any accessibility issues, please do not hesitate to send me an email at janani at msu.edu. And I'll send you my slides with all text and better contrasts. I just want to make sure that all of you are able to read the slides. All right. So these are a few of our group's interests. We are a computational biology group. Uh, we are equally passionate about uh, education and diversity and all things data analysis and visualization. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with what we do, in our group, we work on both the pathogen biology itself and the host responses to pathogens. So this is the outline. I mean, this is how I'll be taking you through our stories. So the first part of this talk is gonna focus on pathogens and microbial pathogenesis, how we got to what we are doing right now, the need for a much broader approach and our recent web application that we developed and what are our um, next steps based on what we've done. And then we'll switch over to the host response to microbes, um, a recent story on connectivity um, metrics that is involved in drug repurposing and how we apply it to of identify host directed therapeutics in TB and what the next steps are as we broaden it towards all other infectious diseases and comparative transcript transcriptomics. All right, so most of what we do in our group is through an evolutionary uh, lens. We are interested in understanding several aspects of what makes each pathogen tick through the lens of computational evolutionary biology. Pathogens are constantly evolving in response to their environments and their hosts, and more recently, in response to the drugs that we administer against them. We are broadly interested in all of these aspects and basically studying the evolution of microbial pathogenesis. Most of us who are working on pathogens are interested in fundamental questions such as pathogenicity, virulence, what makes a pathogen a pathogen, host specificity when multiple slightly related species are showing a selective preference for one host versus the other, what makes it so, and then how they have also evolved specific response to treatments. So we are talking about antimicrobial resistance versus susceptibility. We Basically, most of these fundamental and translational questions can be answered by studying conservation and uh, unique molecular features and specificity versus sensitivity. We build streamlined approaches for molecular evolution phylogeny at the protein level and comparative pathogenomics at the genome scales. Let me begin with a biological question that motivated the entire molecular evolution and phylogeny approach. This story started uh, with the very last stretch of my postdoc 
And much of it was actually completed here with an awesome mentee here at uh, Michigan State University, Sam Chen. So basically what we knew, knew up at the, uh, until that point was we had discovered a novel mycobacterium tuberculosis stress response system called the PSP system. PSP stands for phage shock protein. And these stress response systems actually have very, very different looking operons in the three well-known uh, lineages, proteobacteria, firmicutes, and actinobacteria. And what is written in these boxes, these protein names are not important. But if you just look at the colors, for, an in for instance, you'll notice that there is only one conserved color here, which is the black PSPA or the namesake protein. And this is the central effector protein for the PSP stress response system. And while the other proteins are not conserved by name, you still see a lot of oranges. And all these orange proteins are basically different transmembrane proteins. And all the teal shades are transcription regulators. So what we found is that the actual partners of PSPA are highly variable and lineage specific, but it seems like it suffices as long as there are transcription regula uh, regulators in the system and transmembrane proteins that can tether it to the in inner membrane. So that was a starting point. We knew that everything was different except for this one protein. But then I got really interested to see what is going on here. How much of this is actually lineage specificity versus which of these signatures are conserved? And how does all of this culminate in the stress response function itself? Because there's a huge repertoire. When I say stress response, it could be actual response to physical stress, or it can be response to chemicals or antibiotics or cold and um, heat shock response. So all of these come under the broad stress response systems here. So we were interested in a lot of these big questions and most of these centering around the distinct and the conserved themes. Are there any novel themes that we're completely missing simply because we are just looking at our three favorite uh, lineages, right? And are there any other such no novel gene neighborhoods and domain architectures that we can uh, look at when we study it across the tree of life? So for this, to go about doing this analysis at each level, I basically had to devise this comprehensive molecular evolution approach that spanned several molecular and evolutionary scales to study these PSP systems. We looked at homologs of each and every one of these colored genes and proteins that I showed you in the previous slide and every one of their underlying domains and domain architectures as well. I'll tell you in a little bit what these terms mean. And then we also were looking at not just the proteins by themselves, but their genomic context, because oftentimes for bacteria and archaea, their neighborhood is just as important as the protein itself, because ultimately conserved neighborhoods or operons are going to help define function. And finally, we look at every one of these in the context of evolution. So, like I said, we start with these classical PSP proteins, but the very first thing that we do is we realize that standard blast searches, whole protein searches alone were barely sufficient in picking up any of this variety. So the first step was to break it down into their constituent domain architectures. And what I mean by domain architecture is I take a protein, look at all the constituent sequence structure motifs and domains, and how they are stringed together is actually comprising the domain architecture of that particular protein of interest. And again, the names of these domains are not important for the story that I'm going to tell you, so don't even worry about reading what's on the slide, except to see these nice colored blocks are all the different domains and domain architectures that we're interested in. And you can think of these as building blocks that all culminate in this big stress response function. And the next step was, like I said, not just look at proteins, but the evolution and the homologs of each of these domains across the tree of life, and then reconcile them in the context of these domain architectures that together comprise these starting proteins. We summarize these using domain proximity networks and phyletic patterns across these different lineages. And here is a quick snapshot. The namesake protein, unfortunately, was not that interesting in terms of its variety. Most of them were just PSPA by itself. We discovered just a couple of novel fusions in a few lineages, cyanobacteria and actinobacteria. Whereas the other globular protein that also seemed to have kind of a life of its own in the stress response system, had tons of novel domain architectures that we discovered and many of this were lineage specific. The colors here on the right in the stacked bar plot are indicating that 
each of these domain architectures are present in one or more of these lineages. And ultimately, through this expansive study, we discovered the entire underlying fate shock protein stress response network. And these are compiling all the homologs for each of these proteins across the tree of life. And finally, like I said, we want to make sense of all of this in the context of their genomic neighborhoods, which likely imply operons and co-transcribed genes. So here, for instance, I'm showing that we are starting with, okay, sorry. We are starting with one single protein, but we're also looking at its neighbors. We just do a genome walk plus or minus seven genes. And then for each of those genes too, we look at the domain architectures and where the end, and we do this for every one of the homologs that we have compiled from our previous set. So here again, we discovered many, many lineage specific genomic uh, neighborhoods and what this could probably mean for the function of the PSP stress response network in these different neighborhoods. This is centering around TOSTRAC, which, TOSTRAC, which is a, a new domain that we defined through the study, and PSPA, which has certain proteobacterial specific um, contexts, whereas other actinobacterial contexts that uh, where we discover this novel PSPA associated proteins that were important for stress response in only certain act actinobacterial and archaeal lineages. And ultimately, for each of these proteins, we also follow it up with a detailed phylogenetic analysis. So we found that many of these proteins actually had multiple paralogs, meaning copies of these proteins within the same genome. But it was hard to just say when you have a list of homologs to say, what, what does it mean? Is, uh, are these paralogs likely a product of just plain on vertical gene evolution or were these from horizontal gene transfer? And how do you look at that? So first we look at the phyletic spreads of each of these across the different lineages. And then also the phyletic spreads of each of these domain architectures and genomic context to pick up these signatures like I showed you. And ultimately, this is the PSPA phylogenetic tree. And together with the SNF7, the name is not important, together with another family of proteins, we discover that it goes all the way back to the last universal common ancestor. But you see that actinobacteria, which was kind of our starting point, because um, we kind of cared a lot about mycobacterium tuberculosis back then. So it was just forming this small little cluster here. And it makes sense that most of them are clustered here, barring a few homologs. We decided to dig deeper to see what is going on within actinobacteria alone. So the tree on the left here focuses only on the actinobacterial homologs, whereas the one on the right is focusing on the entire tree of life. So on the right, the tree is colored by lineages. So if you see any um, block, which is either only green or only red, those are only archaeal or eukaryotic homologs. Right? On the left, though, what I've shown is we have a phylogenetic tree that focuses on actinobacteria. And here, because we have the data, we can actually color it by the genomic context. So here, when you have a cluster, it's very nice to see that all the proteins that are part of this cluster are, of course, similar to each other, but they also are sharing the same genomic context. And you're seeing that these genomic contexts are kind of falling into their own neat little clusters. So just to take a couple of examples here, the C1 and C2 here, I've just marked them to show that they're both crinibacterial paralogs, but they're part of very different genomic contexts. Whereas, if we take Streptococcus or Arthrobacter, the two paralogs actually have their part of the, they show very similar genomic context. So here we can kind of, it, it lets us speculate. Now we have a little more information that tells us that probably this is a case of gene duplication. Whereas here, these are completely different clusters. And in fact, in a few of these scenarios, we found that this is probably from horizontal gene transfer where it acquired it from a Fermi-cured group. Then that and now when we go back to the full tree, that explains why this blue is sitting amidst other fermi -cures. So all of our analysis let us glean these important insights into the fate shock protein stress response system. And um, naturally, we ended up with tons and tons of data at the end of um, these three or four years. We started with just 15 proteins, each of them from and we used multiple starting points from different lineages to get the 
best set of remote home logs. And we, our search was expansive across 6,500 representative genomes from all three kingdoms of life. And we ended up with about 20,000 home logs, more than 200 domain architectures, and 500 genomic contexts that are conserved in at least two or five different species. So we had a lot of this data and we were trying to figure out what is the best way to actually summarize and visualize this. Visualize this. Okay, it's cool. We had lots of insights, but we can't write a book because the, our first draft did read like one. So we wanted to find the best way to actually summarize this and make sense of it and tell our story, which basically led to building the PSP web app. And this is just an instance that helped us collate our entire results. Uh, why? Because, well, there were too many results and we couldn't make enough plots to make sense of them. So what, and then we added additional features to basically search through these results, make them interactive, queryable, make visualizations on the go in a dynamic manner. And I'll just show you all of this in our next demo. All right, hopefully it's loaded. Okay. So this is a very quick demo of the companion app. This is my awesome undergrad who built the very first version of this app in a, under a month. So, so here we have the 20,000 home logs. All of this is searchable. This links to NCBI. You can search by domain architecture, genomic context. All the pluses here are basically saying that these two, the fusion of this is the domain architecture for this particular protein. And this is the broader genomic context. We are just showing this to you now in text format rather than the fancy colorful thing that I just showed you. And we do this for every one of the proteins that I showed in those colorful plots earlier on. Maybe you recognize a few of these. Toast track, I said, was the more interesting globular protein, the new domain that we discovered. And this is the one that dates back to Luca. So all of this now can be explored here in the app. We can look at the domain architecture. We have the summary. So the Domain by itself is pretty much there in all lineages, but this particular fusion is there only in cyanobacteria. And then we can also look at co-occurrence of these different domains. Again, let me pick a more interesting protein that's not so lopsided. All right. So here we are seeing co-occurrences of these different uh, domains and what is the frequency of that and all of this across lineages. And finally, this is just the proximal network of the toast track protein alone. And all the arrows are pointing towards this being predominantly a C-terminal uh, domain. But when we look at this, this is what led us to find the larger PSP stress response network that connects all of the dots. Because otherwise, these were just independent starting points from different lineages and different operons, right? But we see that in many, many lineages, different domains are actually coming together in surprising ways to culminate in stress response function. Okay, and finally, we also have interactive uh, lineage maps here. We can generate phylogenetic trees, multiple sequence alignments, and like I said, when there are multiple paralogs, you can also just go and see whether here it's actually seems like a gene duplication. They are both part of the same context, whereas sometimes they might be part of completely different contexts and you can search all of this here. All right, so this is me just setting up the stage to say, this was really, really helpful to help us consolidate the results and help tell our story. And through this deep evolutionary analysis, we discovered that the stress response function goes all the way back to Luca. We discovered the larger network, several novel partners and themes that are lineage specific and conserved. And what this means in terms of the role of membrane stability and homeostasis. Which brings me back to, okay, the, all of this started with a very specific biological question, but now my group is all about thinking how can this approach be developed in a more general way so that it can apply to any or all of these different questions related to pathogens. But there were a few practical challenges as we were putting together this approach, even for the PSP study. 
the thing is there were no ready ready to use tools out there and the current tools could only leverage specific subsets of data and these different data types were not really talking to each other as many of you may know in your respective fields and these independent tools were again great for either similarity searches or to chalk out which protein motifs they have or phyletic spreads or multiple sequence alignment but we were not able to look at all of this in one consolidated way to tell the entire story pertaining to that protein family and there were no unified frameworks or tools available to do this that explains the need for a broader approach which brings me to the next mol evolver story and mol evolver is a comprehensive framework that we recently developed in the past couple of years building upon the psp work and we built a web application for the molecular evolution and phylogeny method um this was basically built by three amazing undergrads in the group sam lo and joe so the best part of it let me tell you upfront is we are not just talking about psp anymore so anything that you see going forward is a method that any of you can use for your favorite proteins or your favorite genomes or pathogens so that part is already done now so here we can start with one or more proteins and get the build a comprehensive set of homologs and the original protein family reconstruction but in case you've already run customized searches on your blast you can bring those into or if you have run profile searches you can bring your interpro scan results into the app and for each and every one of these homologs or your individual proteins we do a careful domain architecture analysis similar to what you just saw and ultimately we follow it up with a detailed phylogenetic analysis our vision is to enable biologists to be able to do this for their favorite proteins and pathogens we've been lucky we've had a few fantastic collaborations this past few years and these are a few projects that we worked on and some papers that have come out of it for our group um, in the past 2 3 years here at msu so i'll just take you through a couple more before i switch gears so i've already told you about the stress response system first starting with the discovery of the mtb system and then actinobacteria and now across the tree of life that's currently under review at m systems next we uh, worked with uh, neil hammer's group to study nutrient acquisition systems in staff that i'll tell you about in the next slide and then the we discovered a novel phage defense system in vibrio that uh, with chris waters's group and this one is currently being um, Uh, submitted to nature microbiology and this one is currently under review at nature okay so through uh, with uh, um, chris waters his group basically we discovered a new um, deoxycytidine deaminase phage defense system this basically is similar to a toxin antitoxin system and this was originally discovered in vibrio and what we found is that this is present not just in vibrio but it's present in all three kingdoms and in fact we found that both of these domains the c terminal uh, deoxy the dcd domain okay that's a mouthful so i'm just going to call it D, uh, dcd but it's deoxycytidine deaminase domain which is important for the enzyme function and a p loop antipase domain or the p loop kinase domain which is the n terminal part the reason why i'm showing you what looks like a slightly redundant figure here is to say if you just did a pfam search you would miss this n terminal domain but because we are looking at all possible sequence structure motifs transmembrane predictions cellular localizations and any disorder predictions signal peptides and everything because of that we are able to identify all the different sequence structure motifs that are present in a given protein sequence so here we um they found that both of these domains are actually important for function and the result that we found is that when both of these are present we find there are some homologs even as far as in saccharomyces cerevisiae and then they did a validation study where they actually found that um the saccharomyces the yeast dcd protein could complement the function of the e coli protein and all the stars here are saying that the original study kind of started with 
six different starting points, all of them in proteobacteria, which is in blue. The results are available here on GitHub. And next, we, need, we recently discovered a glutathione import system in Staphylococcus aureus. So we found that it was actually present in quite a few firmicutes, but then when we look closer at Staph, a close relative, Staph epidermidis, did not seem to have this operon. And then when we did an experimental validation, they actually found that the Staph epidermidis is outcompeted by Staph aureus in a glutathione limiting nutrient sulfur environment. So these are just a couple of um, quick examples that I wanted to show where there was a biological question. Here, uh, both of these important for microbial pathogenesis, where we started from the biology, did a um, deep evolutionary analysis, and went back to some experimental validations to figure out what is going on with the system. Since then, we've also um, applied our approach to other interesting questions in uh, cell surface armor proteins in bacillus and thrasis, internal in proteins in listeria that are uh, very important in um, host infection in the gut, and DNA helicase loaders in mycobacteria and um, also other firmicutes, and diagnostics and genomics in mycobacteria. Okay. That's just one buggy box. All right. With that, that brings, to, uh, brings us to the new web application that we developed where um, you can query your proteins of interest. So this is small evolver. We are kind of still calling it beta because we've almost submitted the preprint, but not just quite yet. There are always the last minute bugs that we are ironing out. So let me just give you a quick demo if the app allows. But before that, I just wanted to take you through what is under the hood. So all the computational evolutionary analysis that I showed um, are running on custom R and shell scripts. The web application itself, the front end, is built as a R shiny web application with specific UI customizations with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. We've tested it on most of the uh, key browsers. And in fact, fun fact, if you really want to explore uh, your proteins, you might be able to use it on your mobile too. And I've done that before. So the entire analysis runs on our server, which means if you want to uh, run this entire full analysis that we call, um, it's going to run on the backend, which is our server here at MSU. But all the dynamic summarizations and visualizations are going to run on the client side within the web application. We want to make sure that Mall Evolver is as versatile as possible. So for this, we make sure that it allows multiple types of inputs, whether it's fast A sequence, accession proteins, multiple sequence alignments, or like I said, you can bring in your BLAST or your Interpro scan results. All of these we specify in, in our detailed help documentation, what is the best way to bring it in and what is the appropriate analysis to run. So. Okay, which brings me to, you can also run a tailored set of analysis to add, answer these different questions. A Lot of um, biologists wanted to make sure that they are able to directly get some data and some visualizations that, I can, that are publication ready. So we also provide a multiple, uh, I mean, a wide range of um, visualizations and summarizations on, and graphical summaries for each of the uh, protein analysis that you do. Also, the tables are not just queryable and interactive, but you can also download them as CSV, TSV, or Excel. Okay, and now for the demo. So this is how the app looks. It's almost citable for now, you can just give the link, but if you wait for less than a month, you should have a DOI from BioArchive. So if you say start analysis, it will basically take you to this tab. The default is FASTA because most people are comfortable with FASTA sequences, but you can use other alternate formats here too. For example, if you want accession numbers or multiple sequence alignment, or you just want to load BLAST files. So we have examples of that, right? And based on what you choose, for instance, if you have FASTA sequence, 
you might want to run, run homology searches on your, all of your proteins and the domain architecture analysis. Or sometimes you might come in with a bunch of proteins that you know to be homologs, in which case you'll select that these are already homologs. There is no necessity to run a homology search. All you want to do is a phylogenetic analysis and domain architecture. And when you submit the analysis, you'll get a code which you can retrieve here. So this is an example code here. And we have detailed help documentation that takes you through the different permutations and combinations, different kinds of analysis. If you were to come from BLAST, what should you be doing to bring it into the app, et cetera. Feel free to explore this. We're always looking forward to more feedback. So here is an example run, which I hope has loaded. Great. So once you load a code, which I just clicked on the retrieve analysis there, you can see some quick visualizations here. So this is just a quick summary that takes you through domain architecture, the network, and the phylogeny. But you can go into the corresponding tab for a more detailed search. So this is what I mentioned, where you can download the data, if you want to look at domain architectures, you can look at all of that here. Most importantly, all of this is queryable and it's interactive. Again, if you start with multiple proteins, you can search through that specifically here. So all the functionality that I showed in PSP is available now. But additionally, because we decided to make a lot of colorful figures for PSP, we wanted to ensure that you can make it too. So you can also make the domain architecture figures here now in the new app. So here you can select whether you just want PFAM or structure-based motifs from the CAC database or any other predictions. And finally, dynamically for each of these proteins, you can also generate a phylogenetic tree, which I'm hoping renders soon, and multiple sequence alignment as well. So it naturally picks representatives across key lineages and species or across different domain architectures. So this, for instance, has a tree. And here the, the colored, uh, the colorful version here on the right is basically showing you a cartoon depiction of the multiple sequence alignment. But if you want the real multiple sequence alignment, you can also generate that and you can download this as a PDF. Did I click? Oh, it is happening. Okay. So while we wait the last couple of seconds. Okay. So these are a few of the cool things that you can do now with the Mall Evolver um, app. Feel free to check it out. What we are planning next is every time we spoke about this, this app, and especially when I led with the PSP story, almost all of our collaborators unanimously said, but we would like to do the genomic context analysis too. We don't want to stop with just the domain architectures. So yes, that's coming soon. That's going to be in the next version of Mall Evolver because this is extremely important for microbial proteins. More importantly, we want to make sure that the software environment that we build enables easy incorporation of any new tools that come out there. For instance, now for the past few months, we've been reading a lot about AlphaFold 2. So we also want to add a tab where you can actually visualize the structure of the proteins that you're looking at. And every step of the way, we want to make sure that we are incorporating fair data formats across each of these skills and um, outputs from each of these tools. And most importantly, uh, it is very important to us that we engage actively with the community. That's one of the reasons why we are extremely collaborative. We want to make sure every step of the way, not after the entire app is built, but every step of the way to make sure that this is indeed what biologists are looking for. So we work with them and if there is a functionality that is not useful or if that something that is extremely helpful to them that we don't yet have, we always work with them to make sure that we have the best tool out there that actually helps them answer these key biological and translational questions. We also give uh, tutorials periodically at both um, regional and national conferences to make sure there is widespread adoption and to also develop the um, application better. So now we have a generalized computational evolutionary approach for any gene and genome of interest. 
We already have the web app, and I just showed you the beta version now. But the computational biologists in the audience might say, that's not customization enough for me. I want to do more. So we are also building a companion R package that's currently under development. Hopefully, it should be ready by early 2022. Our favorite pathogens that we have tested all of this on are basically staph, mycobacteria, vibrio, bacillus anthracis, listeria, escape pathogens, and brucella, which are across different lineages. And now I'm very excited to also start talking to a few viral folks, especially with the pandemic and all. I want to make sure that this works well with viral pathogens as well. So what next? We have the first step. We have covered a few different scales, but what do we want to do with that? We want to go from these features towards microbial phenotypes. So for that, the first thing that we want to do is basically we did it one gene at a time so far, which was great. It helped with our biological questions, but we actually want to see if we can featureize the entire genome. So if I have a pathogen genome, which is basically a bunch of genes and proteins, I want to see if I can translate them into these multi-scale features. And when I say multi-scale, some of them might be micro, meaning I go smaller than a protein. I look at pro sequence structure motifs or domains and domain architectures, or I could go macro. I'm looking at genomic neighborhoods, pathways and processes, or in this case, since we are interested in antibiotic resistance, I might also want to know if there is any other metadata associated with the genes or proteins or the domains, and also map those features out. So ultimately, we want to featureize every one of these genomes. To what end, you ask? We are interested in basically mapping these multi-scale genomes all the way to particular phenotypes of interest. So let me take the example of antimicrobial resistance that we have been working on since, well, this summer. So needless to say, it's a pressing need. Uh, almost all the CDC urgent and the WHO urgent uh, pathogens are antibiotic resistance pathogens. So this is absolutely critical. While there are great methods out there, there is still a lot of space to cover. And a lot of current methods, once again, span just one or two different scales. We know which are the SNPs involved in antibiotic resistance or which are the genes, but we don't yet know upfront which of these different scales is this phenotype coming from. So we want to be able to use this multi-scale approach to basically map the different features using machine learning models to a particular phenotype of interest. In this case, once again, antimicrobial resistance. And for each of these studies, we do a few different things. For instance, we might be interested in identifying what are the core building blocks for a particular kind of drug resistance mechanism, which means I might take the drug, but I might start with a lot of pathogens with known resistance to that particular drug. I start by building a pan genome and from which I get a gene presence absence matrix. But now we are not just looking at genes anymore. I substituted with all these multi-scale features that we built. So basically I have a feature matrix and I also have the phenotypes for each of these genomes. So basically we want to map these different features to a particular feature in this case, oh, sorry, phenotype, which is a drug resistance. And by doing this across pathogens, we are hoping to uncover building blocks that are very specific to a drug that is highly conserved across bugs. But at the same time, sometimes there might be lineage specific signatures. So for instance, if I'm only looking at staph pathogens, but I'm looking at multiple different resistances to different drug families. Now, when I combine this analysis, I might actually see that while the drug resistance mechanisms or the operons per se are different, they might be more conserved domains that are coming up again and again. For instance, Sometimes they might always need an efflux pump because they need to throw the drug out. Now, which drug it throws out, might, that specificity might be coming from the other domain that it's fused with or which, whichever operon that it's part of. But we want to see if there are any of these um, conserved features that are drug specific or lineage specific and pathogen specific. So this is one of the methods that we are building. And we once again, we are hoping that while we start with antibiotic resistance, we want to make sure that this genotype to phenotype mapping 
will be widely applicable to any phenotype of interest like host specificity or comparing pathogens and non-pathogens, for instance. So on the pathogen level, we, I showed you at length what we are doing at the protein scale and very, very briefly what we are doing at the genome scale. We also have a few methods uh, where we are working with dual RNA-seq and trying to detect non-coding RNA towards diagnostics to identify pathogen-specific small RNA. But next, let's look at what happens in the host in response to these microbes. We focus on a lot of zoonotic um, and human pathogens. That's also in some sense by design. One, we want to make sure that these are really, really broadly applicable and agnostic to the pathogens. But second, because part of my appointment also comes from the College of Veterinary Medicine. But it's been a lot of fun testing it out on these very different systems. So this is a relatively new direction and it's not gonna have a million examples like the first one because we only started working on it during the pandemic. The work was led by two fantastic uh, undergraduates, Kevin and Phoebe. So the first thing that we, was, we wanted to do, it was a very simple thing, or at least what we thought was a very simple thing, like we always start, right? So we thought we just want to, there are some beautiful, uh, drug repurposing methods out there, why don't we just apply those to infectious diseases and then ask our more specific questions that has to do with comparing these different diseases. So le first, let me tell you the basic premise of what I mean by disease drug reversal and drug repurposing. So the idea is that in response to an infection, there are a few genetic perturbations. Gene, you can think of these as gene and pathway level perturbations in the host in response to infection. So this is what is coming from the disease. In theory, what we wanna do is to identify one or more drugs that can best reverse the signature in the most efficient way to make sure that we're as close to normal as possible once we have those drugs. So this is a slightly more mathematical depiction. So here, what we basically are starting with is a set of upregulated genes don't worry about the notations, and a down-regulated genes. These are from the disease. But then what we want to identify are which of the upregulated genes are turned down by the drug and which of the down-regulated genes that are turned up by the drug, which in some sense is the whole essence of reversal that we are talking about. So we want to see which are the red or, okay, maroon, which are the uh, genes that are there at the bottom of the list for drugs and vice versa. So there, there have been many really nice met connectivity methods over the past 15 years. And all of these methods share a number of core conceptual and analytical ideas and use similar statistical techniques and quantities. But we had a really hard time to figure out how these methods are actually related to each other, simply because they were used, they were using inconsistent notations and naming systems. And each method basically had its own new alphabet soup. So if I just have these two formulae next to me, those alphabets by no means correspond to each other, right? So there is no way we could actually tell what was the improvement or the addition of a new method when compared to the old one. What is it building upon? And which is the best method at the end of the day for us, right? That's what we wanted to figure out. So when we were doing this, we realized that this was really confusing and we were not able to chalk out these mathematical details. So my student and I basically went back to the drawing board to map all of this out. And that became a project of its own. It's now available in briefings in bioinformatics. It was uh, published a few months ago. And basically we developed a detailed taxonomy of these connectivity scores, starting with all the major methods that came out in the past 15 years. What is the math behind it? How are these connected to each other? Once again, please don't worry about the exact score names or the math on the slide, except to say that we went through a lot of methods and helped reconcile these methods towards our final goal of still being able to do drug repurposing for infectious diseases. And through the study now, we have enabled a cogent and very detailed understanding of all the current methods out there. We have set it up such that future benchmarking studies and evaluation can be done very easily 
because now all of the old methods have been re-annotated with new uh, notations. So they can actually talk to each other. You can put them all on the same slide. The same alphabet means the same thing across methods for once. And we have a detailed description of each of these methods and this course and what this means too. And all of this is available in a live document. What do I mean by live document? We want to make sure that this is not just a one-time publication, but if new methods become available, we want to make sure that we or others in the field are able to actively incorporate it. So all of this resides on GitHub and we want to make sure that this becomes widely up, um, usable and um, crowdsourced. So finally, having done that, we return to our original problem of which of these methods are good to actually study drug repurposing, starting with TB. Why TB? First, these always love TB, especially for me coming from a developing country, but also because that's where the most data is. Whenever we are developing a method, fortunately or unfortunately, we always kind of pivot towards where there is the most data and where there are the most gold standards. So if I have a new method, do I know that what I'm doing is right? And both of those are good with TB. We once again discover that there are a lot of practical challenges and it's not as simple as going from our paper and directly applying it here. So we first have to understand what is the nature of reversal that we are looking at, right? So the, the up versus up, the down versus down, the different combinations that I was showing you in the other figure, how do we exactly quantify? Because different methods seem to favor different versions of this. How do you choose the threshold for your different disease data? Because once again, there's a lot of heterogeneity in your input data there. And how much data is enough data, right? For instance, for starters, we used, we used 30 odd data sets for TB. Is that enough or is that too much? We just chose that it was kind of arbitrary. We just said, okay, let's just start with only the microarray platform or only the RNA-seq platform, right? And then let's just start with only those that are generated in homo, homo sapiens. But it doesn't have to be that way, right? As long as we find a way to make sure that these data sets can talk to each other, we should be able to use all the publicly available data sets that are out there. And finally, there is also this lack of symmetry between the disease and drug data sets. This is just by design. The drug data repository is amazing, right? So this was done, for, uh, okay, I'm gonna have that slide next, but it has it for multiple different drugs across many conditions and time points and across 80 odd cell lines. But that's not how you get your disease data sets. This is just from some experimental study that has been pushed onto GEO data sets, right? This might be in some tissue type, which might or might not even talk to the drug data that we have. So we have to find the best methods to probably in a data-driven manner figure out, okay, now I have to readjust my baselines. So if, if this is the baseline for my disease, which is the most similar baseline of all the 80 cell lines, and then kind of prioritize and say, Maybe these are the cell lines that I want to compare it with. But every step of the way, we've had to make these choices and figure out what's the best way to implement these connectivity scores. And I told you about all of this in the previous slide itself. So what we have started to do now is to systematically generate these disease signatures and generate the disease drug permutation scores or these connectivity scores based on these different methods and try to start with FDA approved drugs and eventually all the other drugs too towards host-directed therapeutics. And there are more than 20,000 perturbogens, but there are only about 7,000 small molecules and 700 drugs. So we are gonna start with the LINX dataset, which is a great repository for the drug data. And here is just some preliminary data that we very recently acquired. So here I'm showing it across 30 different um, TB data sets and uh, the aggregated score, which has vanished, is supposed to be here where the arrow points. So that little <laughs> subplot is supposed to say when I've aggregated the signature and I've gotten one TB signature rather than these 30 odd signatures, what does my uh, drug prediction look like? So for instance, lower the score, the better the drug re repurposing or the drug reversal. So here we are seeing robustly that Warrenostat comes up in both the individual TB drug scores 
as well as the aggregated one. But there is still a lot of work to do, like I said, because we have to figure out what is the best way when you have noisy real life, just out of the public data sets for disease data. Ultimately, what we want to do is to be able to compare this with other infectious disease data sets so we can get disease specific signatures. And we, we probably also want to come, for instance, right? I'm saying that I want to reverse the signature, but in infectious diseases, a good portion of the signature is just your uh, host cell responding to the infection. And this is an immune response. And this is actually something that you don't want to turn down because it's a good thing that your body is trying to fight the infection. So we also want to make informed choices about which part of the signature do we want to reverse based on these comparisons to other infectious diseases and also to other extreme conditions like autoimmune where your immune system is in hyperdrive. We also want to uh, compare it to other chronic diseases. And hopefully the method will also be able to give us different drug combinations that are able to work against a given disease of interest. I'm very close to end of the talk. So um, without further ado, I just want to thank all the people that have done this amazing work that I showed you today. We've had a lot of fantastic collaborators at MSU and beyond. I'm also very grateful to the beautiful art and data science community that I'm part of. And all, much of this would not be possible without that. We keep learning every single day about the best ways to go about how to develop a web application or an R package, or more importantly, how to do all of this in an inclusive manner. We have a beautiful MSU um, data science and R community that I'm lucky to be part of. We've also had some recent funding that has helped support all of the work that I just showed you. And I'm happy to take questions. While I've only generously given you five minutes, I'm happy to stay on for further questions too. Thank you so much for being a great audience. Do folks have questions that they want to ask? I can kick off first, maybe. Um, you know, given what you're sort of talking about with um, the drug, the drug signature reversal and sort of the challenge that for infectious diseases, it might be dominated by the immune system. Have you considered doing anything like a matrix factorization approach and trying to kind of remove that immune system component and then just use the residuals? Yes, yes. So we don't yet um, have any of that um, out there, but that is definitely something that we are working on because uh, that's probably one of the better ways to filter out the signatures, I mean, filter out the, what to say, these unique versus shared signatures, because that is kind of critical to um, how we go about drug repurposing. So absolutely. Yes, we'll be looking at other similar and slightly dissimilar infectious diseases, uh, di um, diseases with similar pathologies. For example, they need not even be infectious, but maybe they all have a lung pathology, or maybe they have a shared, um, lipid metabolism deregulation. So all of this we want to be able to decipher when we systematically compare our disease of interest with all other signatures out there. So, and that is a great method to do it. Hi, Dr. Ravi. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. First of all, fantastic talk. Um, very cool um, apps you have. Um, just like a more of a broad question. So um, following up on like your drug response um, methods of basically reverse uh, identifying, I guess, to determine like the evolution of resistance. Um, do you foresee that this, I know right now a lot of this is based off of like microbes. Do you foresee like a, a similar idea could be applied to maybe like cancer data sets um, using maybe PCGA data? that um, maybe have acquired like chemotherapy resistance and doing something similar on that front? Or what do you foresee some of the problems would be? So the way that we have currently set it up, uh, because once again, because we, have, we are just starting out, we're just starting with gene expression data sets. 
so in theory at this especially at this stage um this should be easily transferable to other non infectious diseases too in fact that's the way that we are also going to be able to compare our signatures with other chronic and non infectious diseases out there so we will be comparing it with other cancer signatures it's just that you are saying you're going to be starting with cancer signatures instead to figure out what are the um responses that are very specific to your particular cancer type and whether that can be used for drug repurposing and absolutely yes that can be done um further along the way we might be adding other host pathogen interactions to bring about synergy between the pathogen and the host side but at this stage our host uh, methods are equally applicable to infectious disease and uh, non infectious diseases yes i hope that answered your question yes thank you either i went really fast or really slow i might ask one more question <laughs> kind of on the software development side sure. um you know so so um how what kind of resources do you need to keep those servers up and you know how are you um uh, how are you planning to maintain them uh, this seems very much like a question from my grant reviewer so <laughs> so the this is an excellent question kc so uh, we currently we have msu hpc but uh, we recently purchased our own uh, server I, i don't know probably not for the best of reasons but we basically have our own server and that's where all of this is running we have we had an amazing system administrator who was taking care of the back end and the maintenance plan really was i would basically go through me and my students would basically go through make sure that it has the most current data set for instance every 6 months make sure it's up to date with the genbank and refseq data and all the pfam and all the other dependencies are up to date update the r and other frameworks and make sure that it works seamlessly and have a scheduled regular um, server update but these are all standard things that we are doing but the way that we want to scale is to basically um, have more computing power and also shiny at the end of the day it's great it's awesome but it's relatively lightweight when compared to a lot of other web applications we could potentially build but this is kind of a proof of concept that at least we know this works and this is helpful but we want to be able to scale it so lots of people can use it in parallel and that is not yet something that shiny can support us at this point so all of those are future plans and hopefully we can maintain it in a similar manner too gotcha thank you well thank you for taking the time to share with us um, i'm looking forward to meeting with you uh, tomorrow and hopefully uh, others are as well so thank you thank you so much all of you have a good day